how do we deal with anger? And um, this is a topic that's often asked about. It can be very useful sometimes to reflect on how we should deal with this hindrance. As you, as I mentioned, it's one of the four, uh, one of the five hindrances which we often uh, encounter in meditation. We may not always be aware that we are encountering the problem of ill will. Sometimes it may present itself as restlessness instead, but there is ill will behind it. So let's first talk about anger. Is, what is anger? What do I mean by anger? In Buddhism, anger means the destructive emotion, the intention to want to have somebody else suffer. And there is this, it is a destructive tendency. Uh, it's one of the three forms of defilements which uh, the Buddha has, or somebody who becomes enlightened is said to overcome. Uh, it's actually very important in Buddhism in the sense that the, the very definition of enlightenment sometimes is given as somebody who has overcome greed, hatred and delusion and one of the definitions of becoming a monk is to lay down your weapons and become a monk, which was an important part of becoming a monk in the time of the Buddha. In the present day, fortunately, or perhaps in some places, unfortunately, this is still an issue. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, fortunately, in many places, it is no longer much of an issue to um, or to lay down the weapons. But anyway, um, the, there is a, um, a very clear definition was given about uh, uh, um, the, the emotion of anger in meditation and in our daily lives. The, so in the Buddhist text, they say that it's, anger is wild, like a provoked snake. It's very destructive. It can destroy ourselves and the people around us very quickly. Sometimes it's said that uh, anger is different from uh, uh, greed or um, uh, desires that are not helpful in the sense that anger very quickly is destructive, has a very uh, quick, strong force but can easily uh, be overcome. And on the other hand, greed is something that is a more subtle kind of force. It gradually builds up and is uh, harder to overcome, but it's far less destructive than anger. And uh, so that's the difference between these two emotions. It's also said that anger spreads like a poison in the sense that it destroys yourself. This connects with the next point in that it burns up its own support like a forest fire. When you are angry, you not only destroy other people, but the first person who suffers when you're angry is yourself. Because when you are angry, you're sometimes your good qualities, your good habits will become less uh, will be become damaged. You may have thought, you may have been grateful to somebody, but when you're angry with that person, you forget about that gratitude. It's destructive, like an enemy preying on someone. It might just come up suddenly without you realizing or without you actually with it taking you off guard. And it may there's different causes that are there actually in, uh, in Buddhist texts, the, the Buddha actually, he mentioned nine causes of anger. Um, there are, uh, the cause may be that you feel hurt, which is kind of logical, right? When you feel hurt or bitter about somebody who has done something to you, that may be in the past, in the present or in the future. That is an important distinction because the anger of being hurt in the past is quite different from being hurt in the present. When you are angry about somebody who hurt you in the past, it's kind of like a bitterness. It's, 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 um, it sounds like you're, you're holding somebody a prisoner in your mind 
and you want to do something back to that person or you want to take revenge or sometimes you just want to make sure that he knows or she knows. And the anger about somebody's hurt you in the present is much more about a sort of fight and flight response in which you might respond aggressively to somebody's hurt you at the present time, but then later regret it. So anger and regret are often going together, which is one of the other reasons why we need to deal with it. And there may also be anger about the future, which is usually a sense of suspicion. That you, are, you are fearful and angry with people who you might think will hurt you. Yeah. This may not only be about yourself, but also about your loved ones. Sometimes that is more subtle, but it's also uh, like you, you're afraid of your children or you are uh, angry because somebody hurt your loved ones. And there is a certain more subtle form of anger, which sometimes some Dhamma teachers say that that is actually the worst kind of anger. Some te Buddhist teachers say, which is the anger of actually nobody's hurting you but somebody is much better off than you in some aspect, which is also a form of subtle anger, which we call envy or jealousy. So these are the causes of anger as they arise in our lives. And this, the, the problem of anger is it tends to fool you. We are often not aware of it. And if we are aware, we still think it's justified. That's why in the Buddhist text, they say, Anger is fools you just like a medicine mixed with poison. You think it's going to help you. And sometimes it seems to get things done, but in the end you suffer as a consequence. Some people ask me, isn't anger justified in some cases, for example, when there is social injustice? In this case, we might be reminded of the case of Gandhi, who was actually very uh, emphasized very emphasizing in that in his life, he would not be led by anger. And that in his cause, which he had, of course, millions of followers in India and the time when he tried to make India independent, he actually very much had to emphasize not to be angry, to get his cause done and to make sure that India would become independent. So whenever he was led by anger, he would he would step back and then reflect on himself and, and try to do it a different way. Because if he knew that if he would let, let, allow himself to lead by anger, instead of finding justice, it would just be a form of revenge. So one of the, re one of the causes for Gandhi, for example, he was not a Buddhist, but his philosophy was very similar, is that he, he, looked, he thought about the suffering of people and then tried to help them. That was his motivation, which he called the uh, motivation of the truth or satchagraha. Now that's a, a bit of a sidestep there, but it's an important example because many, many people ask me that. Isn't there some cases when anger is justified? Isn't there sometimes when my loved ones, they, or when some people hurt me and I really should sell, say something about that? That's, that's true, sometimes we should. But should we say that with anger or with wisdom? That's the question. Now let's study about the anger a little bit more. Okay, let's see. Oh, sorry, there's some delay here. And it's also said in the Buddhist text that whatever you wish for another, it comes to you. So when you're, anger, when you're angry, this, the odd thing is that when you want something bad to happen to another person, it tends to come to you. <laughs> so you, want, you might want to wish another person to be ugly or unhealthy, have bad sleep or fail in his life, have, be poor or have a bad reputation, have uh, no friends, no, no, no one who wants to love him or even an unhappy rebirth, if you believe in that. All of those things, the Buddhist texts say, because you are cherishing anger, it comes back to you right the same way, in the same way that you visualized it for the other person, <laughs> which is also kind of a, 
uh, interesting thing to think about. <laughs> there is an important expression in the Buddhist text, an important uh, quote. And this is a story uh, about, um, about uh, Devas. Do you know Devas? Devas uh, are, uh, in Buddhism, they are higher beings. Um, they are not visible, visible there. You can compare them with angels or something like that. Whether you believe in them or not is not really relevant. It's just a story that illustrates a point. So um, there's different kinds of devas in, in Buddhism. There are the devas that are just simply called devas, and then there's asuras, which is similar to the titans in uh, Greek mythology. Perhaps some of you know that the titans always tried to fight, and there was uh, some, some uh, fight among the higher gods and lower gods. This is also in Buddhist mythology. And this, there was a fight between these groups of devas and eventually the devas captured the leader of the asuras, the other group. And the, the leader of the devas, his name was uh, Saka. And they, they told him that the leader of the asuras, uh, his name was Vipachitta, he said, they said, He's very, he, he shouts at you, he's very angry about you having captured him. And he's always cursing you, why don't you do something back? We have now imprisoned him, maybe we should kill him or something like that. And then Saka would, would say, it's not good to do that. We have already captured him, we should never lead ourselves by anger, we should uh, we should not do anything back to, if he wants to shout, let him shout. If he wants to curse, let him curse. I don't care about that. And then the assistant of Saka said to him, well, maybe you're wrong because when he's shouting at you, when he's cursing at you, people will listen to it. When you're not doing something, when you're not doing something to him, you will be seen as weak. So that's often the case when we are not responding in kind when somebody's angered, angry to us. Other people will see us as weak. You know, they might say something to you like, what it, well, who are you, the Dalai Lama or something? Why are you not saying something back? Why are you not doing something back? This is an expression which might occur. <laughs> what are you, Mother Teresa or something? Do something back to that person. This is the sort of uh, encouragement that people might give to you when somebody's hurting you. And in this case, uh, Saka, he, he says that um, sometimes we have to distinguish between what is the real victory and what is not. So let's see what he says. He says, and this is actually partly quoting the Buddha himself. <clears throat> To repay angry men in kind is worse than to be angry first. Do not uh, repay not angry men in kind and win a battle hard to win. To repay angry men in kind, which means that you are angry with those who are angry to you, is worse than to be angry first. What does that mean? That means when some one person is angry in a, in any given situation, there is usually not much of a problem yet. But when two people are angry, <laughs> then you have a serious conflict. So that's what Saka means here, to repay not angry man in kind and win a battle hard to win. The translation is a bit odd here because it's been translated by a Sri Lankan monk. <laughs> it's, it's probably correct English, but a bit old. So, uh, they, so it's actually considered a battle to win, like a personal victory, if you are able to keep your calm when the other person is angry. He practices for the welfare of both. 
his own and the others, when knowing that his foe is angry, he mindfully maintains his peace. So this is not only about uh, about this particular situation when two people hate each other and they are enemies in battle. This is actually about our personal lives. You know, uh, when you talk about uh, happiness in marriage, in a relationship, our abbot Lompard Tamachayo, he once said that uh, the one rule that you should always keep is be angry at a different time. <laughs> <laughs> so he said that if you are angry at the same time, that's when all things go wrong. So he said, if you want to know how people are married happily, be angry at a different time, he said. <laughs> so when you are angry, but your loved one is not, then you are still able to solve the situation. When your loved one is angry, uh, when you are not, you can still fix it. You can still find a situation. You can still walk away and then wait for the other person to calm down. This is actually sometimes mentioned in questionnaires considering emotional intelligence. Has any one of you ever had an EQ test when you had to do a, a job interview? Have you? Yes. So when you do an EQ test, sometimes they ask you this exactly, exactly this point. If somebody else is angry, how do you respond? And the best answer given is that you keep calm and maybe respond at a different time when the other person's calm down or respond by, by, by uh, dispersing the pressure or, or distracting the person or something like that. But uh, the, the wrong answer is, of course, I will tell him, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is uh, actually emotional intelligence before it was invented here, what we can see in this Buddhist text. So he practices for the welfare of both his own and the others when knowing that his foe is angry, he mindfully maintains his peace. When he, achieve, when he achieves the cure of both his own and the others, the people who consider him a fool are those unskilled in the Dhamma. So what does that mean? So when the assistant of Saka told him that you really have to do something about this, this prisoner of yours who is always shouting at you and is cursing at you. And then, so then he said, if you don't do something about him, then you will be seen as weak because he's been traveling across the country, even though he was a prisoner, he was traveling as a prisoner across the country and he's been shouting your name, he's cursing you all the time. If you don't do something, you will be seen as weak. And then Saka says, what do you consider strength and weakness? If somebody uh, is responding with anger to somebody else who's angry, you may see that as strength, but I see it as weakness because when you, the real goal, how much higher goal than keeping the peace in the country is for the human being to develop himself as a noble human being. So he says that the highest goal of mankind is not just to keep order in society, but to develop one's humaneness, which is actually a very nice text. Um, I always thought that the example given was a bit odd talking about devas when the Buddha could just have talked about people. Why did he give the example of devas? But later I understood that probably it may have been a symbolic story when he was actually referring to politicians or something, but he didn't want to mention that. So what does it mean? Are those unskilled in the Dhamma uh, that means that you are not aware of what are the what is wisdom, what is the good perspective to look at life. So to deal with anger or not to be led by anger is for your own and the other person's benefit. So once we have established that, we can try to find a way how to deal with anger. 
So these are some examples given in the Buddhist text. Uh, this is the, actually the classic list of antidotes against anger that are given in the Buddhist text by the Buddha himself. Uh, the first one, of course, is how to deal with anger by developing loving kindness. So loving kindness, or in the ancient Indian language, metta, metta. Uh, I've heard that there is actually a basketball player in America who's called metta because he he's likes this teaching very much. <laughs> uh, so he actually called himself metta, he changed his name. Um, by developing loving kindness means that you develop, you try to make the quality of loving kindness more stronger in your life. So perhaps you have done some loving kindness meditation sometimes, have you? Yes. Yes. This is uh, usually done at the end of the meditation when you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is usually done at the end of the meditation when we are actually um, um, uh, almost uh, finished with the meditation, we take some time, maybe five, 10 or 50 minutes, 15 minutes to spread your good intentions to the rest of the world. And this is usually about three groups. Your people who you like, who you love, those are the easiest to spread loving kindness for. If we think about our loved ones, our, um, partner and children, or a husband, wife, children. These are the people who are easily to think about in a loving and kind way, for most people at least. <laughs> so if you are thinking about them, then you feel love coming up. This is the start. And then you move to uh, people who you don't know, people on the street, people on this, in the supermarket who you never met that help you, that serve you or give you some service. People in the restaurant or wherever you go that you do not know. Maybe some coworkers that you've never really talked to or the cleaning lady. All these people you come by in daily life, you don't know them. How about we learn to develop loving kindness to all those people? in our daily life. And we can do this in meditation also, and also outside of meditation. Once we have practiced this often, the last step, which is the hardest, is more easily, that is to de develop loving kindness to those who we dislike, or traditionally called developing loving kindness to one's enemies. And I believe that Jesus also called, used this word, right? To love your enemies. Of course, most people these days will not describe the people that they dislike as their enemies. But whatever term you use, there will always be people that we have difficulty with. Like in Dutch, they would say, the kind of people that you usually don't want to go through the same door with. <laughs> so uh, these people, sometimes if we are too, uh, if we set the standards too high for ourselves, you might think, how can we love our enemies? How can we love the people who we dislike? This is very difficult. This is a very high bar. I cannot make it. But if we start by loving, spreading loving kindness in general in our daily lives to ourselves, to the people around us that we know and do not know, then it will gradually become easier and the bar will be easier to, to make. So this is the thing that we need to take into account. Every good quality, every virtue in life has different steps to it. So if we set impossible standards, then we will always think of virtue as somebody else's responsibility. <laughs> so it's better to, 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 net, to take things one step at a time. And there is also compassion. Now, compassion and loving kindness is very similar, but loving kindness is the wish that other people are uh, happy, and compassion is the wish that other people may be free from suffering. Uh, so these, these are two qualities that are very similar, but compassion is a bit more active. If you really want to free somebody from suffering, you first have to know that people suffer, suffering, the person suffering, which is hard to, to really want to see that. So this is a very active approach. 
It's a little bit more active than loving kindness. Then there is equanimity. Developing equanimity means that you develop uh, the habit of uh, understanding that, first of all, we cannot always control everything in our lives. We cannot always control everything in our lives. So that is actually the most important thing that is meant here. We cannot always be, uh, first of all, we cannot always control everything in our lives. We cannot always take care of everything in our lives. Some things are not in our control. We have to stop focusing on things that we cannot control. Then we will be less angry. Sometimes we are angry about the traffic jam. Well, there's nothing to do about the traffic jam. So if we are angry about that, we're just wasting our, our own energy. So that is sometimes some things we just have to let go of. That's why the Buddha, he said, it's, it's not a quality to be looked down on, equanimity. So equanimity may sound like a kind of a philosophical word, but it basically just means to be even-minded, to make sure that you're not investing your emotions in things that you cannot control. So on a similar note, it also the Buddha says we shouldn't be paying attention to the person we are angry with. So in, sometimes I mean, you may have heard of the um, remark that um, everyone, um, sometimes you hear the, you hear the um, advice that when you are angry with somebody, never write a letter. Have you ever heard of that? Maybe you've heard of that. It's, it's kind of, a, um, kind of a, uh, received wisdom that if you want to, um, uh, you are angry with somebody, please don't write a letter. In these days, of course, you could add to that, don't write an email or don't chat. <laughs> so there's a lot that we can do wrong when, as soon as we start to act on our anger. Sometimes the best way to deal with anger is just to let it be for a moment. Just let it sink down and it will gradually fade away. The greatest mistake that we sometimes can make is to start being active when we're angry. <laughs> sometimes it's better to wait until it's faded. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we should be aware of our anger and why we, we have become angry and keep in mind that there's something wrong here that needs to be fixed. We shouldn't be, a, uh, what do you call it? We shouldn't be led by apathy. We should do something to the situation. We should solve things. So there is wisdom. We shouldn't abandon wisdom for the sake of uh, abandoning anger. But the anger is just a very bad advisor. So as soon as we start to do something out of anger, then we get into conflict with ourselves and with others. And we tend to be a bit uh, not so subtle in our you know, ways of fixing things. Mm. But it doesn't mean that we always need to avoid any conflict. So I, for example, in Thai society, sometimes every conflict is avoided. And you, are not even, you cannot even express your, your disagreement with somebody for fear of conflict. This is too extreme. And um, this is uh, sometimes the kind of the weak point of Thai society. But the strong point of Thai people is that they don't show their anger and they're not led by anger. And they do they generally think that anger is a bad thing. Then there's the fifth one, which is the most deepest and profound one, which is that we consider that everyone is the owner of his karma. <clears throat> what does that mean, the owner of his karma? It sounds like a sort of a, um, <clears throat> like an advertisement slogan or something. <laughs> but it actually, it means um, that everyone has to carry the consequences of his own evil. So whenever somebody's done wrong, we have to realize that there is no way that that person can flee from the consequences of the own wrong, the, own, the wrong things that he or she has done. There's no way to flee from that. So everyone, uh, according to Buddhism, is under, this, under the influence of karma, is under the law of karma, which is a bit long to explain right now. But just the general gist of it is that 
when you do good, you receive good. When you do wrong, you receive suffering. So when you know that, sometimes the best way is to let karma unfold itself. And there is, doesn't mean that there is justice in the world. We don't say that, but there is a sort of a mechanism in the world that people tend to suffer when they do wrong. They already suffer. So this kind of helps sometimes to overcome anger as well.